Welcome to Handmade Happenings. I'm Melissa and today I want to introduce you to smocking and specifically English smocking because there are a few different versions of smocking and types. So the obvious first question is what is smocking? I once saw it described as a series of back stitches worked over pleats and what this does is it allows you to take large pieces of fabric and condense them into smaller pieces while still maintaining some elasticity. From my understanding, this was originally used as a practical technique. Think on the ends of sleeves to hold them tighter to your wrist while still allowing it to fit over your hand. Now it is mostly, from what I've gathered, decorative. You often see it in heirloom sewing and I think it's just such a lovely technique. I really like little girls dresses with smocking. So today I'm going to show you a bit of an introduction, kind of what are the stitches, how do you pleat your fabric, as well as some great resources for beginners and the patterns that I recommend. So what do you need for smocking? Uh, there's not a lot of supplies really that you need. If you're going to do a lot of smocking, you may want to invest in a smocking pleater, but we'll touch on that more when we get into the actual tutorial and how to pleat your fabric. But to start out, you're going to want a pin that can be erased, like either the water erase, heat erase pin, for marking your fabric. Regular sewing thread and needles, embroidery floss, and an embroidery needle and your fabric. Now, fabric-wise, since this is mostly an heirloom technique, usually I've mainly seen it on cotton, uh, cotton batiste, sometimes cotton broadcloth, occasionally flannel. I've not seen it, I don't think, on much too thicker than that because the thicker your fabric, those pleats are going to be harder to um, pleat up and all. So the first thing you need to do with smocking is pleat your fabric. And if you decide that you really want to do a lot of smocking, you may decide to invest in a smocking pleater. But I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you are fairly new to smocking and therefore I will be showing you how to pleat your fabric by hand. So I'm demonstrating today just on a rectangle of fabric. Generally speaking, it should be about three times as wide as whatever you need your finished piece to be. So if you have a pattern, there will be, if it's an insert, there will be a piece that is the size and shape that your final piece needs to be. So you take that and you measure it and you cut out a piece that's three times as wide and about half an inch taller because you need room for those pleats. Generally speaking, your patterns are going to have two extra rows that you're going to pleat, and those are called holding rows. So, for example, today I'm going to pleat six rows. Four of them will be for smocking, and then I'll have a holding row at the top and a holding row at the bottom. To start out preparing your fabric for pleating, you need to mark the fabric. So, these marks need to be a quarter inch apart and then in rows that are three-eighths of an inch apart. So I'm just going along every quarter inch and making a mark. And if I was doing this for an item that was actually going into a garment, I would use a pen or marker that was either water-soluble or, um, what's it called? heat erase. As it is, I'm demonstrating, so I'm using a Sharpie. So, you can see, pardon a few of my um, missteps, but that's what this looks like. You're going to do this all the way across the width of the fabric, and then you're going to start a second row underneath it. So let's finish this row, and then I'll show you where the next row goes. Okay, so you have your row of dots that are spaced a quarter inch apart. This row goes all the way across this 
piece of fabric and ideally it's as straight as you can make it. I tend to struggle there so I'm not sure but the next what you're going to do next is another row of dots still spaced a quarter inch apart from each other but three eighths of an inch down and they need to be in line as much as possible with the row above. Now these measurements are based on a smocking pleater and the size of the rows, how far apart, um, like how deep the pleats are and how far apart the rows are. You can, as far as I know, there used to be like iron on dots that you could get. I don't know if those are still available, but um, basically they're like similar to those embroidery designs where you um, iron them on and then that would mark your fabric that way. Or you could create a graph of your own, so like a paper one that you could then use a light box over top of to see what you were doing and where you had your positioning. Or you could buy a graph. There is a um, channel here on YouTube, Sarah Classic Sewing. She created a graph for this and I don't remember. It's not very expensive. It's like a PDF one that you can download. I think it's only a couple of dollars. If that, it may have been a free download, I don't remember, but I will link it below if I remember to do that. So you're just going to continue this however many rows that you intend for your smocking to be. And remember that you need however many rows for your design that are required plus two holding rows. So the fabric is all marked. And I'm sure you can tell it is kind of uneven. I'm not very good at that part, but uh, I wasn't trying actually that hard this time. So I have a needle threaded. I actually have seven or five. However many rows this is, that's how many needles I have threaded. And I have a pretty long tail on it because this is easier if you can keep the fabric as flat as possible. If your thread is too short, your fabric is going to start pleating up at the ends. And it can just make it harder to pleat if everything is not flat. So, got my needle threaded. There is a knot at the other end. So I'm just going to come here and see where that first dot is. I'm going to make a very small stitch. And this is on what's considered the back of the fabric. So if this was a print, all the markings would be on the back. So make that small stitch and then come up to this next dot. Make a small stitch. Come to the next one. Small stitch. And you're going to continue this all the way across to the other side of the fabric. And if you've ever done cartridge pleats, this is pretty much what this is. So periodically you can just pull it through. This is kind of what it should look like. And you just keep going until you get to the other side, uh, or other end of the row. Alright, so we've made it to the end of the first row. And you're just going to leave this on. At least I do. This is long enough that if I only had one needle available, I could definitely um, remove the needle and re-thread it for the next row. But I do find that leaving the needle on is easier. So just leave that one and start on the second row. 
and repeat until all of the rows are done. Okay, so this is all heated and it's time to tighten these threads. So I just pull on these ends here. And you can see they start to bunch up. And you don't have to necessarily pull them all at once. Sometimes it's easier if you want to look in groups of two or three rows at a time. And just pull. And I usually, for this point, pull initially just as tight as it will go. So next it's time to um, tie off the ends. So you are going to want to spread your pleats back out to whatever size uh, width you need. This piece was about 18 inches, so I'm going to push this one out to around 6. So I'm just pushing it with my hands and get it pretty straight on this end and then tie off these threads. And right now it doesn't matter that all the pleats are uneven. That's going to be, they're going to be evened out after everything's tied off. So I'm just going to tie knots. You can use um, groups of threads. I find it's easier because then the um, knot is less likely to rip through and come out. So, you know, groups of, again, two or three. And with these tied off, you just clip these threads. And now you're just going to push the pleats and get them as even as you can. Um, both even as in like how many are across in the space and then also even as in you want them straight up and down as much as possible. This can be a little tricky, especially if you've hand pleated it, but you know, just take your time, work it out. Sometimes it's helpful to pin your piece down. This is at this point right side up. And just maneuver as much as you can. Sometimes it's just easier to see things this way. Not always actually, but sometimes. Sometimes it's easier to see what you're doing from the right side. And the pins just help everything stay in place. So if that helps. Some of my pleats look a little rough and indistinct. And that is because I hand pleated and did not really do it very precisely. If you're more precise, you'll have needle pleats. And obviously, if you're using a pleater, you'll have even more neat pleats. Although I did find that while having a pleater helped a lot, it does not necessarily solve that problem. So usually at this point, I do go ahead and kind of block the fabric a little. I don't know if you're supposed to do this. I thought I had read something that said you were, but I don't really remember where I read that and I may have gotten it mixed up with a step that comes later. So this may be optional, but I always do it. So just take your iron or your steamer or whatever and just run some steam right over those pleats. And you don't need a lot. 
But now that just, I think the reason I do it is pretty much it almost seems to hold those pleats in place so they're not shifting around when you're smocking. So you just do a little and then you let it cool and then you'll be ready to actually start smocking. Okay, so uh, first off, if you have a solid fabric, the way you know the front from the back is the depth of your pleats. So on this side, you can see it's a pretty deep pleat. I can get that needle in really far. On this side, the pleat is not as deep. Like, that thread is right there. So that's how you know the difference between the two sides. Um, obviously, you can smock from the other side, like, if you accidentally pleated your fabric wrong and you had a printed fabric, you'd just use the right side regardless. So, to start your smocking, we're going to start by learning the cable stitch. And I find that most smocking plates are just combinations of cable stitches and wave stitches. So that's what the two stitches I'm going to show you today. So, to start with any smocking, you're going to take your needle and insert it from the wrong side of the fabric up to the right side. And you're doing this on the left hand side of that first pleat. And this is specifically for right handed people. If you're left handed, um, just switch the instructions. If I say left, then do right. And if I say right, do left. Um, and I am just using a basic embroidery needle and three strands of embroidery floss. So you've come up on the left hand side of that first pleat. Now you're going to go past this first pleat and the second pleat. And on the second pleat you're going to come from the right side of the pleat and insert it from the right to left. and pull it through. Now your embroidery floss is either going to sit beneath your needle or above it. In this case mine started out below the needle. For the first one it doesn't typically matter unless your smocking plate calls for it to be a certain way. You just need to know where it was. So this one was below. So for my next stitch I'm coming, my thread is now in between on the left side of this pleat. Here. So I'm going to go to the right side of the next pleat and I'm going to make sure my floss is above the needle. See it's up here, the needle's here. And then insert it from right to left and pull it through. And then repeat. So come to the right side of the next pleat and insert it leaving the thread now below the needle. So each time you do a cable stitch, it's going to alternate between being above the needle and below it. And you just repeat. You don't want to pull your stitches overly tight. Like, you don't want to go like that. But you don't want them hanging out like this either. So you want that kind of even tension. You know, where it's just kind of slightly pulling on each pleat. And sometimes as you do this, you'll start to just kind of even out the pleats a little more from where they are on your pleating thread. I had a knot that I could not get out so I had to clip my thread and you can see it's a little short now so this is a perfect opportunity to show you what to do if you run out of thread mid row. And that's you take your thread and you see where the thread is it's in between these two pleats here. So you go down underneath to pull it to the back and then you flip your work over 
can tie your knot. And to bring it back, you're just going to go to the wrong side and come up, back up, in between the same two pleats. Usually, if you've already tied that knot right there, it's pretty obvious where you need to be. And now you're once again back in between these two pleats. And so, you move over to the next pleat and continue your cables. And usually a cable is done the top and bottom of any geometric smocking. And if you're doing picture smocking, which is when you're oops, literally making a picture with your floss, is they are made up entirely of stacked cables. So you're doing this cable typically right along the uh, right on top of the pleating thread. So those pleating threads are not only holding your pleats in place, but they are acting as a guide for your design. And that's why it's really helpful to get these as even as possible. Okay, so we're at the end of the row, and you end this just like you would if you ran out of stitches in the middle of the row. So you go down in between those last two pleats, pull it out on the wrong side, and tie a knot. So now that the cables are done, we're going to move on to the wave stitch. And this is basically just a stitch that you're going to go from one row up and then back down and up and down. Typically on a smocking plate, it's going to say something like do a one space three step wave. What does that actually mean? Well, the spaces are referring to the rows. So. A one space would be from one row up or down to the next row. Steps is referring to stitches. So in three stitches, I should go from down here to up here. So to start your wave stitch, you um, start on the left-hand side, like before, pull up on the left side of that first stitch, and you're going to do post a cable stitch. And if you're about to go up with your cable stitch, or, um, with your wave stitch, you need to go down with your cable stitch. And if you're about to go down with your wave, you need to go up with the cable. So one down cable. And then slowly, I'm going to work stitches moving up. And the goal is to be at this row by the third stitch. So one, two, three. And now we're up at this upper row. And then since we're at the top, I'm going to do one up cable, and now we're ready to go back down. So, if you're doing this, when you're going down with your wave, you want the thread to be up above your needle. And when you go up with the wave, you want the thread to be below the needle. So we're at the bottom of another wave, and we're going to do a cable, a down cable, because we're at the bottom, or however you want to look at it. But yeah, down cable, because you're down in the wave. And then 
three steps back up. And then an up cable. And so you can see how it's starting to form a wave, and this pattern just continues all the way across. So I am going to finish this row and then I will be back to demonstrate how you can tone your waves into diamonds. We have our row of waves. Now to tone these waves into diamonds, you're basically going to work a wave that's opposite of this one. So you're going to start on the exact same row as before. But this time, instead of doing a down cable, you're going to do an up cable. And then instead of working three waves, three step wave up to this row, you're going to work three steps down to this row. And then do a down cable, which is opposite of the up cable up here. And then work your way back up. Now we're back up and do an up cable. And now you can see how it starts to form a diamond. And you just continue that all the way across. And you can do multiple rows of these. And it creates a really cool effect. And honestly, you almost don't even need to have like any other designs. Most geometric smocking plates seem to be, in my experience at least, variations of the wave stitch, you know, different combination of number of stitches and how many spaces it goes, and cables, sometimes even like multiple cables worked in between your wave to create more of a scallop instead of a diamond. After you finish with your smocking, you're going to need to block it again. And this one is actually important because I found that if you don't block it, if you put when you pull out the pleater threads, your piece will just kind of stretch out a lot bigger than it's supposed to be. So I usually pin it down. Every once in a while, I tend to block um smock very tight and pull my stitches too tight so I always measure it or compare it to my pattern piece to make sure that it's still the same size and if it's not then I just stretch it back out to that size and pin it down and just hit it with another wave of steam And now we just allow it to cool, and once it's cooled, we can pull out the pleating threads. So the 
piece has finished drawing and now it's time to remove these pleating threads. So I'm just going to flip to the back and clip all of those knots. They should come out pretty smoothly. And there you have it. Now you can see what I mean about it kind of keeps that elasticity. So if this was the cuff of a sleeve, I would still be able to fit it over my hand. So that's how to smock. Now the question becomes what to smock. For patterns, I recommend the Children's Corner Store patterns. They have a wide variety of heirloom sewing patterns and the easiest one that they have that includes smocking is the Johnny. And that's because this is a basic straight insert. So all you have to worry about is sewing it into the garment. Obviously, I wasn't able to get into any of the aspects of smocking and using it in a garment, which if you want to see a video about that, please leave it, let me know in the comments because I am definitely happy to do it. In fact, I may do it regardless, but it will probably happen much faster if I know somebody is looking for it. The next pattern that I would recommend from Children's Corner is the Lee dress, which is only slightly harder than the Johnny. So the Lee dress is that classic little girl's yoke dress, which can be done either with smocking or without smocking. After those two patterns, as far as being the easiest, there are a few other favorite patterns that are not necessarily easy. There's obviously the smocked bishop dress, which is a pretty classic heirloom dress. This one isn't necessarily easy. In fact, I think it's considered more difficult, but it is a nice um, style to try at some point. Uh, the Children's Corner Jamie is a little bubble suit. To me, this one's more difficult actually because of the construction of it. There's a lot that goes into making it even if you're not doing smocking. And my final one, and honestly my favorite one to do for little boys, is the Basics for Boys pattern. And this is just so cute. It's about as difficult as the Lee, so not terribly hard. As far as the smocking goes, it is a lot of buttons and buttonholes to sew though. You may also want to use a smocking plate when you're smocking and that is just to guide you along. It's kind of like a pattern for your smocking. For picture smocking, I recommend ones by Cross Eye Cricut. I find that their directions are very thorough. For geometric smocking, my two favorite patterns of plates are by Ellen McCann. The first is the Jamie. I use this one a lot for both boys and girls and it looks amazing whether you use two colors or one color. The second is the tartan pattern and this is just another fun geometric one that looks good especially for little boys outfits. And as always I have to give some tips and resources for you. The channel and website that I recommend the most for learning to smock and really anything heirloom sewing is Sarah Classic Sewing. And she has a website and a YouTube channel with so many videos on smocking, how to pleat, um, how to construct different garments, and all kinds of tips and tricks. She also has a website which she, where she sells some of her patterns. Thank you so much for joining me for this introduction to smocking. I hope it was helpful and I will see you next time.